Okay, Tempe, you can start. You got any question? Good morning, Bhante. Good morning. All right. Um, so I don't see a question yet in the chat room today, but um, I we had a question from last time. Um, and the question was, um, reading and watching the news often brings me great suffering, given that there is so much war and violence in the world. Is it enough to practice metta in our personal lives or are we obligated by the Noble Eightfold Path to try to do more to promote peace beyond our local communities? So the question is, should we um, do more besides just practicing metta to promote peace uh, beyond just our regular our um, local communities? Uh, actually, practicing metta at any time is good. Mm. We all know the world suffering uh, is going on. So many living beings are there in our communities, other communities in this country and other countries and so on. So long as living beings are there, suffering is there, definitely. It is impossible for any one individual or even millions of individuals to eliminate all the suffering in the world. Uh, therefore, our uh, practical uh, way is to practice metta for all living beings and we practice metta for our own benefit. We become calm, peaceful, free from hatred or anger, and reduce our suffering. If I have repeated many times, if each and every individual practices metta, those individuals who practice metta are the ones who are benefited from metta practice and not those who do not practice metta. While we are practicing metta, some other people may fight, kill, hate, and so forth and so on, which we cannot stop. I think uh, this uh, question is uh, uh, very uh, uh, coming from a very compassionate person, uh, but uh, this is what I have to say regarding this person's question. And, uh, okay, uh, any other question? Yes, Vante. <clears throat> the next question is, um, what's the meaning of the different colors worn by monastics? Some wear maroon, some brown, some yellow. Is there a meaning behind these colors? No, actually, uh, we are supposed to color our robes in order to uh, disfigure it, not to be attractive. And the difference uh, in uh, choosing colors depends on individual uh, liking, taste. Uh, otherwise, there is no any particular significance. Uh, Nowhere can we find any uh, religious significance in the different changes, the different colors. This uh, is individual choice. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bante. Uh, the next question is, how does one know where one is on the path? It seems to me the higher my level of gener generosity, and happiness towards others uh, and higher mindfulness, I feel more and more, um, hmm, okay, not so, uh, 
Yes. Um, I, I think the person is saying they're trying to gauge where they are on the spiritual path. Um, and um, they feel like they have more generosity and feel more happiness and higher mindfulness the more this is occurring. Uh, they also see uh, human nature more and more separate from theirs um is that conceit hypocrisy or laziness or just some kind of awareness um they're afraid basically that the conceit is building up in in their practice can you comment on this i think i lost Billy uh, yes. I understand the question. Uh, hello? Yes. Yes, I'm here, Bante. Yes. Uh, do, do you want yeah. me to clarify the question again? Yeah. Um, I, I think that the, the, the question is that the person, uh, through their spiritual practice and... Um, um, practice of, of mindfulness, um, they're starting to feel some kind of separateness with the other people. And uh, they are concerned that this may be a form of conceit that is building up. Uh, can you clarify this, if this can be the case? You see, when you practice uh, uh, mindfulness, that is really a part of uh, metta. And uh, uh, as a, a, a part of the Noble Eightfold Path, it is the uh, seventh step of the Noble Eightfold Path. And uh, uh, if you want to follow the Noble Eightfold Path, all of them, you have to follow all of them. That is with understanding uh, you start with understanding. Every step you follow, everything you follow, uh, or the Dhamma, you must understand why you follow it. Uh, and then, you see, you, after that you can speak, you can think of uh, wholesome thought, like generosity, loving friendliness, compassion, and so forth. And uh, you no, you abstain from killing state and sexual misconduct and uh, and uh, so forth. Then abstain from uh, telling lies, slanderous talk, and uh, so forth. Then you live a wholesome life, life, wholesomely, following a wholesome right livelihood, and make right effort to overcome your prevent unwholesome, unnecessary mental state, and so forth, practice right mind, uh, effort, then practice right mindfulness, then you practice right, right concentration. All of them knitted together, then you practice one, uh, very diligently you can see the connection uh, the, the, that practice with the other factors of enlightenment. Then you know that you are following the noble eightfold path. Uh, you from your own experience, yeah. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Bante. The next question is: Could you please clarify whether it is possible to attain enlightenment through metta meditation? Mindfulness in metta meditation. Yeah, can you attain enlightenment? through the practice of metta meditation? Practicing of metta, you overcome your anger, hatred. And uh, that is one of the root defilements. Once you overcome the, uh, one, once you learn how to overcome uh, your anger or hatred, you can see how ha hatred is connected with uh, ignorance and desire. You hate something or someone because you have a desire to be the person otherwise. 
you, you want a person to behave the way you like, there you have a desire. Then that, that is the same as a craving or unwholesome mental state. That is the second root defilement. And both of them, uh, hatred and greed, uh, arise in your mind because of your ignorance. So you overcome your ignorance. Therefore, even if you start with metta, you understand this metta itself is not something permanent. It is because you may, you create it in your mind. Whatever is created in your mind is impermanent. Uh, so, yeah, Buddha says, Yanki, Chetitan, Sabbatam, Anicham, Nirodhamma. Whatever we mentally create, that is impermanent. So, you can see the whole teaching, uh, entire teaching uh, of Buddha, when you start practicing even one of them. You said you want to practice metta. The question is, can you, by following metta, can you liberate yourself from samsari suffering? I say yes, provided you understand the connection between uh, metta and all other wholesome states and uh, uh, connection between greed, hatred, and delusion with all other unwholesome states. And therefore, when you see this connection between these two uh, categories of uh, mental states, uh, and you overcome your greed, hatred, and delusion, you certainly can attain liberation. Okay, next question. The next question is, how to have right effort in meditation practice? How right. do you have right effort? How to have? Uh, how does one have right effort in meditation practice? Well, right effort is exactly a part of meditation. Uh, therefore, when you practice metta, take for example, you are, you are practicing mindfulness. When you practice mindfulness, sometimes, uh, uh, although you are very mindful, your, your mind will run here and there. So you learn that is the state that your mind is uh, not settling. And so uh, any mental factor, any wholesome thing you practice, uh, that leads to your peace and happiness. When you practice mindfulness, sometimes uh, uh, greed can arise. So you need firm effort to overcome that greed. Uh, as we all, always repeat, as you mentioned, uh, effort has uh, four, four steps. Uh, restraining, overcoming, uh, arousing, and development. That is, uh, you restrain yourself, try to prevent when you practice mindfulness, any meditation, trying to prevent greed, hatred, and delusion from arising. These are unwholesome mental states. Jealousy, fear, anxiety, worry, all these things are unarisen mental states at that particular moment. If the and you keep in that state, keep your mind in that state, if there is no greed, uh, you'll be happy that you don't have greed at that time. If you don't have hatred at that time, be happy that you that you don't have hatred, and so forth. So this is called a prevention. However, when you are in that mental state, if greed or hatred or another mental state arises, you immediately nip in the bud. Get rid of it. Pay total mindful attention to it and see the danger of it and uh, return to your mindfulness practice. And then arouse unwholesome and wholesome mental states like generosity, loving friendliness, compassion, and so forth. Uh, and really, particularly mindfulness, concentration, impermanence, and so forth, try to arouse them. That is called meditation. And then, once they are arisen, you 
try to maintain it. They are called the three uh, mental and body called state of effort. There are three efforts. That is Aramadhatu, Nikamadhatu, Parakamadhatu. Aramadhatu means you start the practice. Sometimes you start the practice and suddenly you feel tired and you give up. Practice one or two days and give up. And one practice for two, three weeks or a month and give up. And don't do that. Once you start it, continue. That is called Parakamadhatu. Uh, uh, Nikamadhatu, Parakamadhatu. Uh, then that is continuation, continuing effort. Aramadhatu, Nikamadhatu. Aramadhatu, beginning. Nikamadhatu is continuing actually. Nikamadhatu is continuing. Parakamadhatu is effort to stay on it and maintain it and never to let it go until you achieve the goal. These are the three elements of uh, effort. Uh, therefore, you first make effort to prevent, next effort overcome, and third effort is arouse unnecessary and wholesome mental state. Fourth effort is maintain it, support it, sustain it, and continue until you attain the goal. That is how you use your mind as an effort in meditation practice. Okay, what is the next question? The next question is, um, can we take a brahmacharya viramani as the third precept? I think this refers to lay people um, taking the, the third precept. And uh, the second part is, um, what is the eighth precept exactly? Now, uh, what is the first part of the question is? Uh, Can we take a brahmacharya viramani as the third precept? What is suramera? Um, it, it's uh, a brahmacharya viramani. Can we take it okay. as the third precept? Okay, now Brahmacharya, 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 uh, any lay person can observe it if they really, really make a commitment and determination. They don't have to become monks. On full moon days, new moon days, in uh, many Buddhist countries, people observe the eight precepts, including abstaining from sexual activities. Abramajari. That is one type of eight precept. There is another type of eight precept. This is called uh, lifetime eight precept. And Abramajari also you can practice your, in your entire life if you like, if you can. But there is another eight precept, and Abramajari and so forth is the precept you call oppose the eight precept. Full moon days, new moon days, you observe it uh, temporarily uh, for a day or two or week or so forth. And that is Uposata Atangasila. That is eight precepts you observe on full moon days, new moon days, and stay even for a week and so forth. Other eight precept is called uh, Ajivartam, that is lifetime precept. The first one you may you may find some difficulty to observe all the time, but the second one is uh, very easy in a relatively easy, uh, although it is also not so easy. But compared to the first one, second is somewhat easy. What is the second eight precept? For lifetime eight precept, lifetime eight precept means the uh, third, fourth, fifth step is the noble day so far. Third step is abstaining from uh, high speech, for instance. The third step of the noble day so far is high speech. First is uh, right understanding, 
second right thinking, third right speech. Right speech comprises of abstaining from telling lies, abstaining from gossip, harsh speech, and slanderous talk. There are four. That is right speech. Abstaining from telling lies, abstaining from harsh speech, slanderous talk, and gossip. Four. Five is abstaining from, and then three, abstaining from killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. It is misconduct. Kameshu Mithyanchara. Now, now there are three. Then now we have seven. Eight is right livelihood. Uh, right livelihood. Uh, well, that is uh, some Ajiva. Uh, Ajiva. These eight together called lifetime precept or Ajiva uh, Attamaka. A lifetime eight precept. Any lay person can observe this lifetime eight precept. So, therefore, there are two sets of eight precepts. One is ob observed on full moon days, new moon days, and so forth, uh, temporarily, and for short, on a certain period of time. Other eight precepts, one can observe the uh, entire life. And therefore, they are called lifetime eight precepts, or life eight precepts for a lifetime. Ajiva Attamaka. Okay. Um, what kind of also the third part of the question is having to do with what kind of sila to have uh, when we meet a bhikkhu? Because when when uh, how how what kind of sila uh, a lay person should observe when uh, meeting a bhikkhu? One is. Uh... Uh, going to be a bhikkhu? No, when you're meeting a bhikkhu, what kind of uh, sila should we um, observe? When you are meeting a bhikkhu? Yes. Oh, that is a, you know, a lot of etiquette, manners. Uh, they are uh, not... Uh, uh, set as uh, precepts separately, but uh, people normally have certain uh, manners, etiquette that they have to follow when they meet bhikkhus. For instance, in uh, Buddha's time and even under that, in, in generally in uh, Asian countries and so forth, uh, when they see, uh, this has been even uh, mentioned in text, when they see uh, a big cook, when suppose a lay person is sitting on a chair, when a big cook comes, he stands up. When they talk to a big cook, they don't talk to a big cook standing. It is considered to be very rude. Because a monk has to look up, look up to talk to the lay person, and lay person has to look down at the monk, and therefore, when lay people talk to monks, they must sit down, and they must fold their palms, and uh, pay respect to monks, and then sit down at uh, not too far, not too close. And that's close enough they, that they can uh, hear each other. Uh, that kind of distance. They sit down. And when they give something to monks, they must give it respectfully with both hands until the monks accept it. Uh, so for these are the sort of manners and etiquette that lay people are supposed to follow. Uh, these are not uh, hard and fast rules. In some countries, some people don't uh, observe them because they don't know. 
So the bhikkhus should be flexible enough, humble enough uh, to understand their culture, their nature, and not to get uh, offend, or offended. So this is what I like to mention. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bhante. Uh, the next question is, how can one achieve the initial application of thought in the path leading to jhanic concentration? So I think it has to do with vitaka, vichara, in order to attain jhanas. Can you please explain how to uh, attain initial um, application of thought? Initial instructions? Initial, initial application. Thought, initial thought. Okay, initial okay. Thought. Yes, for, for the jhana. How to achieve the initial thought in the path leading to jhanic. Okay. Now, this initial thought is very confusing translation. Uh, uh, that in Pali, vitakka vichara. Vitaka Vichara. But English translation, I don't know why they said he translated it as initial thought. Uh, I don't know what is that. That doesn't make any sense. Any in the Vitaka Vichara uh, Vitaka is thought. Vitaka means thought. Uh, Vichara means maintaining that particular thought. What is this thought in attaining jhana, first jhana? Before attaining first jhana, you overcome your hindrances. Uh, you overcome your greed, hatred, uh, restlessness and worry, uh, and uh, doubt, mm, uh, uh, and sleepiness and drowsiness, these are the hindrances you overcome. First is you overcome your uh, greed. In order to overcome your greed, you have to develop the mental state called generosity, letting go, letting go, letting go. What do you let go? Whenever the greed arises, you let go of the greed. That is a thought. That is a thought. That is vitakka. You let go of the hatred by practicing metta. That is a thought. Then you overcome your sleepiness and drowsiness. That was a mental state. You let go of that by rousing, you know, by visualizing bright light and so forth. That is a thought. Deliberately you let go of it. Restlessness and worry are thought by bringing your mind again and again back to your breathing. You overcome restlessness and worry. That is the thought. Then you have doubt. You you overcome that by thinking of the qualities of the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, and so forth, arousing your sadha in the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, and so forth, overcome your doubt. Now, these are all thoughts. When you start your meditation practice, you have to overcome these unwholesome thoughts and then arouse your wholesome thought. That is, th these are the thoughts. And they is called vitakka. Next word is vichara. Vichara means sustaining they, those thoughts. Sustaining metta, sustaining uh, generosity, sustaining uh, awakening, sustaining uh, what you call sadda, faith, and so forth. All these wholesome states that I mentioned, we have to maintain, sustain. And from there arises joy, happiness, and concentration. <clears throat> joy, happiness, and concentration arise from or letting go of this unwholesome mental state and developing this wholesome mental state, you gain concentration. That is the process of attaining jhana. But the word initial thought and sustained thought, in a sustained thought we can understand sustaining this wholesome thought. Initial thought uh, does not make any sense. Therefore, it should be replaced by thought. What kind of thought? Wholesome thought. Wholesome thought. 
uh, arouse these wholesome thoughts and sustain it. From there arise joy, from there arise happiness, then from there arise concentration. Happiness is a stepping stone for gaining concentration. This is called uh, Sukha, Preeti Sukha, joy and happiness. Happiness, Buddha said, Sukhino uh, Chittam Samadhyati. Sukhino, Sukhino means one who is happy. One who is happy. Happy mind gains concentration. And therefore, uh, this is how we have to understand initial, what you call, uh, the thought process in attaining jhana. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. The next question is about having critical thoughts of others. The person is saying that they feel awful when they have critical thoughts of others. And um, that she also heard that if one is critical of others, then it means that this same thing, this same flaw is actually within oneself, even if we don't know it. Uh, she feels that this experience of being critical is unpleasant and she would like to make sense of what she's doing when she's doing this um, with a negative um, critical mind. What's your advice for somebody that has a tendency to be very critical and um, seeing the, the flaws in others and oneself all the time? So like an aversive personality type. What's your advice? If somebody is critical of you, you just don't worry. If you are critical of others, then you have to think about it very carefully. Because when you become critical of others, you completely ignore yourself. And uh, you cannot... Uh, control other people's mind, uh, you cannot control even your mind, much less than controlling others' minds. And therefore, when critical thought arises in your mind, make all effort not to do that, to abstain from criticizing anyone. And uh, the Buddha has given many advices, Sudha Sang Vajjangane Sang, Atanopana Dudha Sang, Atanopana do the sang vajjani what you call atanopana do the sang opunati athabhusang that means uh, one would uh, uh, one can easily see others faults but one cannot see one's own faults and one's own faults they hide like a crafty gambler hides the card when he play when they gamble, play cards. Uh, similarly, one's own uh, faults they hide and blow, magnify, exaggerate others' faults. And therefore, this is very detrimental to your spiritual growth. And uh, if you have a critical mind, if you criticize others, then you have to take care of yourself not to do that. If somebody criticizes you, you cannot stop that. Because that person comes from a different background, different education, different mentality, different health, a different kind of food, a different type of livelihood, different kind of work, different kind of parents, different kinds of friends, and so forth and so on. Because of those different backgrounds, uh, that other person might criticize you. Uh, you cannot have any control over that. But if you control, if you try to criticize anybody else, then you have to be very careful, very mindful, and don't do that. That is detrimental to your spiritual growth. Uh, 
Um, I forgot the third line. Anyway, uh, the meaning I already told you. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Bante. Um, the the next question is: um, How can we? Can you please elaborate on how we can apply yesterday's teaching on the Arya Vamsa Sutta? in our daily lives as lay followers. So how to apply this teaching from Arya Vamsa Sutta in our daily lives as lay followers? Actually, for a lay life, lay person, uh, it is rather uh, difficult, not impossible. Uh, even the monastics, uh, those things are not very easy, but monastics are in more favorable situation to make effort and practice them. Uh, lay people, for instance, first one is uh, clothes, second is food, third is lodging, fourth is meditation. So these are called uh, noble lineages, noble lineages. The, the monastics can be content with whatever rope they get. Lay people normally cannot uh, observe that, that uh, principle. However, if somebody is humble enough, simple enough, dedicated enough, practice meditation, that person can observe this. Uh, whatever the clean, neat clothes uh, they get, they should be satisfied. The person should be satisfied. Not try to buy a new fashion every month, every week, every year, new dress and so forth. Learn to be content. They can practice that. Similarly, food. If they eat, they buy food. Uh, not they don't go on Pindapati like monks. Uh, people don't bring food to their homes every day. Uh, monks get most of the time food from outside. Therefore, monks can observe the uh, principle of following the Arya lineage. But lay people buy food, and therefore, if they want to practice that, they like they should get enough. Uh, food uh, with uh, necessary protein, vitamin and so forth and be content with that instead of going from restaurant to restaurant, restaurant to restaurant looking for new food and so forth they can contain, they can maintain the containment and uh, house uh, if they People normally change their houses, buy a new house in every two or three years or five years to make, to make them more comfortable. But if they have a house to live and uh, there are enough uh, facilities uh, without any uh, dangers, they must be content to live in that house. That is the uh, containment. They can observe them. And then talk about, they talk in praise of them and encourage others to do that. That way they also can help to uh, maintain the environment, save environment, protect the environment, and so forth. Uh, of course they can practice it. They have to have a, some kind of dedication. The last uh, noble uh, lineage is the practice in meditation. And then all everybody can do is lay persons and the monastic. So that is what many people try to do these days. They at least practice meditation. Perhaps the other three, some of them even practice the other three as well. But if any lay person want to practice, they can do practice. They can practice. Okay, friends, we are, we spend, uh, a little uh, time longer, a little bit longer. Time today, uh, 
to uh, in the answering questions. And now I have to end this part and we do some, we spend some time in meditation. Okay? Um, Okay. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings have happy minds. Whatever living beings there may be, without exception, weak or strong, long, large, medium, short, subtle or gross, visible or invisible, living near or far, born or coming to birth, May all beings have happy minds. Let no one deceive another, nor despise anyone anywhere. Neither from anger nor ill will should anyone wish harm to another, as a mother would risk her own life to protect her only child. Even so, towards all living beings, one should cultivate a boundless heart. One should cultivate for all the world a heart of boundless loving friendliness, above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hatred or resentment, whether standing, walking, sitting, lying down, or whenever awake, one should develop this mindfulness. This is called divinely dwelling here, not falling into erroneous views, but virtuous and endowed with vision, removing desire for sensual pleasures, one comes never again to birth in the womb. With this metta thought, let us practice meditation uh, at least for another uh, 25 minutes, uh, maybe less than that, a short period. And as I mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, I ring the bell. And when I ring the bell, you don't have to stop. You continue meditation if you like, if you can. Uh, so let us begin the practice. <laughs> uh, sit up in a comfortable, relaxed position and breathe deeply and breathe out deeply until all the air in your lungs is gone. So next breath will bring lung full of air and oxygen and then like this you can strengthen your lungs and make it uh, expand to the to its limit and then contract to its limit then that way you don't have any difficulties in breathing. Lungs will be clear of uh, uh, phlegm, mucus, and so on if there is any. And uh, you can you can be aware of uh, impermanence of your feeling, perceptions, thought and consciousness very easily while you are focusing mind on the breath, which also is changing all the time. And that way you can gain the true established nature of everything. Element of nature, established nature, and law of nature. What is that? Everything is impermanent. Buddha said whether the Buddha has come into existence or not. This established law, this root of law, this, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, practice or 
uh, system exists. What is that? Everything is impermanent. Any impermanent is, is unsatisfactory. What is unsatisfactory is without self. So when you understand these three, also you understand this is not I, mine, this is not I, this is not myself. When you understand this is not mine, your greed disappears, craving disappears. When you say this is mine, this is mine, this is mine, your craving increases. Tanna. When you say this I am, this I am, this I am, your mana, conceiting, dita, tanna, mana. And when you do this, then uh, you, you, when you say this is myself, this is myself, your ditti increases. So when you say this is not mine, this is not I, this is not myself, your tanna, mana, ditti, craving, conceit, and wrong view will vanish, at least temporarily. And that is the core of vipassana meditation. I think, friends, this may be enough for you since you have been practicing meditation. It will not be difficult for you to gain this insight and therefore I wish you good luck and keep practicing.
ਕਿਹੜੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਵਾਹ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਨਾਮ ਲਵੇ ਨਾ by means of this knowledge or this deed may i never join with the foolish may i join always with the wise until the time i attain nibbana may the suffering be free from suffering may the fear struck be free from fear may the grieving be free from grief so to may all beings be from the highest realm of existence to the lowest may all beings arisen in these realms with form and without form with perception and without perception be released from all suffering and attain to perfect peace excellent 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 now friends our time is up we have to end this session and i want to share my metta again with all beings especially those who are suffering in hospital taken care of by very compassionate doctor nurses and hospital staff may they recover very soon and return to their normal life practice dharma practice meditation and uh, liberate themselves from samsaric suffering and all those doctors nurses hospital staff that take care of these people risking their lives sacrificing their comfort find time to practice meditation dhamma and liberate themselves from samsaric suffering all those who have lost their loved ones and grieving may they be free from grief and find the time to practice meditation and know the nature of dhamma and liberate themselves from samsaric suffering all others who are in all ten direction north north east east south east south south west south south west uh, north west up and down all of them without any exception be well happy and peaceful and you all include that into that group all of you and so may you all be well happy and peaceful i have to leave you all because of the dana time dana people are here and so we have to take care of them as well okay thank you huh? Thank you. 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 Thank you.